I wanted to read real, real quick one more little thing about Van Gogh. This is just a little, little description of his life, really. I mean, it's, it's not terribly long. Um, he basically created all of his artwork in about 10 years' time. And, and I'll tell you in a second how many that was. It's pretty amazing how many. But it, it, it describes here that, that his artwork hauntingly conveys through its striking color, coarse brushwork, and contoured forms the anguish, the anguish of a mental illness that eventually resulted in suicide. Uh, it says here that when he was about 20, he had a, a religious zeal awakened within him. I remember we talked about religious preoccupation, and he probably had some of that. He, he Apparently, he gave away uh, his only worldly goods to the poor and was dismissed uh, by, his, by, his, by people around him for his literal interpretation of Christ's teaching. Um, so in these 10 years, he created 800 paintings and a similar number of drawings. So 1,600 pieces of artwork you know, in 10 years, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of work. Um, but, it, but it also shows you what somebody can do when they're manic. Um, in February 1888, he had painted more than 200 canvases in 15 months. Uh, he was suffering recurrent nervous crisis and hallucinations and depression. He was enthusiastic for the idea of founding an artist's cooperative. That was the word I couldn't think of. So he wanted to start this artist's cooperative, and he was joined by his friend Gauguin. But he ended up having a fight with Gauguin, and that's about the time that he cut his ear off and sent it to his, his girlfriend. But um, uh, and then you know, and then he painted that painting that I showed you of himself. In May of 1889, he went at his own request into an asylum at Saint Remy uh, near Arles. Um, but he continued during the year he spent there in a, in a frenzied production of tumultuous pictures such as Starry Night. That was painted when he was at the, at the I think I said that, at the uh, mental asylum. And he did uh, 150 paintings besides the drawings in, in a year. Um, and during the last 70 days of his life, he painted 70 canvases. But his spiritual ang anguish and depression became more acute, and on July 29th of 1890, he died from the results of a self-inflicted bullet wound. So he ended up committing suicide. Back in those days, we didn't have, there was no medication, there wasn't anything to use to treat him. So unfortunately, that's the outcome that can occur. But in this day and age, you know, we do have good treatments. And they're not for everybody, as you mentioned. Um, and kids, I think, is, kids are really a different, uh, sort of a different ball game uh, than adults. For adults, the medications we are studied very well, they work very well. Um, but it is some trial and error to try to figure out what works well for kids. Okay, so that's all I have. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. There's actually a website called Famous People with Bipolar Disorder. And you get on there, of course, there's a bunch of folks I've never heard of before. Maybe it's my age. I don't know. But, uh, but there's a lot of folks on there that uh, you'll recognize. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. There are several books written by people who, like Patty Duke. She has a book out. And there's also a psychologist named uh, Kay Redfield Jameson. Uh, and she's a psychologist who has bipolar, a classic bipolar 1 disorder, and she's responded very well to lithium. But she describes, she's got a book called An Unquiet Mind um, and several other books, uh, and she describes, you know, what the different mood states were like and uh, feeling suicidal and, and how the lithium, you know, evened her out pretty well. Um, it's classic. What, what, what happened to her is what happens with everyone with this illness is that it takes years and years to figure out, to finally, finally for the message to get, to, to get through that, you know, I've got to do something. My life's destroyed. I've lost everything, and I've got to take this medicine and, and you know, stay, stay on the straight and narrow. I mean, I want you guys to think about the brain as being real. I mean, it's not, these, this isn't some kind of made-up thing. It's not hocus-pocus or, you know, it's not because you sinned or you didn't do this right or that right or whatever. It's an illness. It's a, it's a, it's a circuit problem or, uh, or a chemical imbalance, however you want to you know, think about it. I mean, we don't know what the answer is, but it's some molecular disorder. It's a small, small, small level uh, of the nerve cells and the circuits working together or not working together like they should. And that's what's happening. So when you scan a brain, you don't see it. Not yet. But again, getting to the point where we can, get, we can take a picture of the brain in action and see what parts of the brain are being used when you think certain thoughts or you do certain things in the scanner. Um, the problem is the resolution is not very good, so you just see a blob of red. It's hard to know what nerve cells are active in that blob. I mean, eventually we'll get to the point where we can say, you know, hey, map it out. And, you know, area number 115, when it's low, that person has a very high risk of bipolar disorder or something like that. That's what I would imagine someday would happen. But that's a great question, great thoughts. Any other questions or thoughts? I just have a question about relationships that have bipolar, 
Yes. Yeah. Is there anything you can tell me about that? How to, like, with teaching them or somebody in a social situation or things that make it, things that other people say to them that make them feel worse, things that make them feel better, anything along that line you can tell them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if they picked up, but the question is, uh, if you know somebody that has bipolar disorder, are there any pointers, I suppose, for interacting with that person, things that would uh, maybe prevent them from feeling stigmatized or feeling bad about themselves, but also, um, maybe, I guess, empower them? Or how, and, and maybe the other part of your question would be, you know, since they don't, since they like to feel these ways, how do you deal with that? How do you convince them that taking a medicine is the right way to go? That's a tough one. As far as the interaction with somebody with bipolar disorder, I would interact with them. Uh, I wouldn't treat them any differently than somebody else. I mean, I wouldn't purposely. I wouldn't treat them like they're an invalid or something, because then, you know, because folks, you know, folks don't want to be treated that way. Um, I also wouldn't. Um, you know, there's a lot of things people say without really thinking, like, "Oh, you're crazy," or you know, things like that. That's those aren't good statements to make when somebody has a mental illness. And I don't, that's any kind of mental illness, really. Uh, so some of these things are kind of general, you know. Um, now, you know, you can try reasoning with somebody, but I've done it, and I've done it. I've spent hours in sessions sometimes re trying to reason with somebody who's manic when I was in residency, trying to reason away the mania, you know, trying to convince them they're manic and they've got to take medicine. It doesn't work. And you can do it and do it and do it. It just doesn't work. At some point, you have to be a little strong and say, I love you, I care about you, but you need to take this medicine. You really need to take it. And, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to get them so agitated that they get violent or something like that. It, it, but, and if they get that way, you know, then they probably need to be in the hospital. But, um, but you, know, you know, reminders that, that, okay, do you remember when you did this? And do you remember when you did this? And sometimes, you know, taking little notes about things that have happened, things like that. Um, but you don't want to also constantly be in their face with things either. So, because otherwise they'll get very agitated. Um, my first experience on the psychiatric unit in residency was, uh, was just right out of medical school, first rotation of my third year, which is the clinical year with psychiatry, and I went to Midtown, which is you know, Wishard, and this guy who was manic, a huge, you know, a big guy, taller than me, and you know, pretty, pretty heavy. You know, he was probably 250 or something like that. Um, found out I was going to be his, his uh, doctor, his resident, you know, and uh, he got me in a room. I couldn't get out, and uh, the nurses had to come and rescue me because I could have been pummeled pretty quick. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't said anything hardly to the guy except that he came and asked he wanted to pass out, you know, pass to get out of the hospital. And I, I just told him, I, you know, we just talked to the treatment team and I didn't think that was, you know, necessary yet, but I'll come talk to you in a minute. Well, he didn't like that too much. So when you're manic, you can be pretty irritable, pretty on edge, and it, it can be kind of dangerous sometimes. So, yeah, you don't want to do, it, you think, think sort of common sense wise. If you start to see him get louder and louder and louder, back off. It's not worth it. You know, things like that. So those are some pointers. Um, does that cover, can you think of any other situations that you, specific type of questions that you would have? It's a very general question. Yeah, I try to answer that fairly generally. I guess when it comes to depression, usually the people, uh, people when they're depressed, they have a little better idea that they're depressed. I mean, they, they might. And if they don't, they're not usually as um, hostile about it if you, if you bring it up. If you say, I, I'm just, I just think you're kind of depressed, you know, and you start talking about it. Probably doesn't hurt to, to uh, get information for them and show them, you know, hey, this is these are the symptoms of depression. You got every one of these. You know, I think we should see somebody or something like that. Um, supportive things about supportive things about you know, hey, the brain is just like any other organ. It can have problems too, and, and that's you know, when it does, it can be things like depression and mania. It doesn't mean you're weak or any of that stuff. Statements like that are good. Um, I can't think of anything else, I suppose, at this particular moment. When you're uh, in the manic state, you also tend to have get delusional also. Yeah. Thinking other people are yep. who they are. That's yes, the, quite the possible. That's called psychosis, when you don't think in reality. And a, and a delusion is a is really a thought. And we talk about hallucinations, and hallucinations where you, you see or hear or taste something that's not that other people don't see or hear or taste, okay? That's a hallucination. A delusion is a thought. Somebody's out to get me. I know they are. And, and usually delusions are very hard to break. I mean, again, you can try to reason with somebody that has a delusion. Forget it. It's not going to work. Um, because by definition, a delusion is something that's it's, it just, it's stuck on their minds. It's the first thing on their mind all the time. They can't get it off their mind. Interesting thing about delusions, we should, we'll have a talk at some point on 